we're still here. So uh, I always like to be before lunch on the first day. If it all <laughs> uh, but the important people are here. So today we'll talk about, um, OK, you got this great idea. And I, I don't plan all my slides. So um, uh, you got this great idea, and nobody wants to listen to you. You know, what do you do? And I was very impressed. I think it was Hank Wu, first day today, first day. Um, I, if I had to design a system, at least what he said is the right way to go. You got, I actually took some notes on paper. So. <laughs> uh, but he said uh, they have, the company has an innovation operating model. Started, I think, 18 months ago or something like that. Um, they like they do a hackathon, which is basically a planning meeting. They call it a hackathon because MIT developed some concept, but it's really just a planning meeting. And my philosophy is: every hour you plan, you save 10 hours of chaos. Don't be afraid to plan. For sure, those of us who do software development know: if you don't plan, you do it all over again. You know, for sure, as you heard, right? This one crashed. That one crashed. You know, and the B team is better than the A team. And, and what's also nice is that they have a budget, and they can do proof of, of concept. So uh, I'd like to know how they got there. So, but at the end of the, at the end of my presentation, I, I put together little questions for that we can that we can uh, discuss. Okay. So, um, how do we do this? Uh, I tech. That's it. Broken. Doesn't work. Is that working? I don't know. What am I supposed to aim? If not, I. Yeah. Oh, is it maybe not turned up? Okay. Okay. Always make sure the plug is in. Uh, can everybody hear me? I don't need a mic. Do I? If I do, uh, let me let me know. So uh, we want to talk about um, how to avoid resistance and inefficiencies when there are new ideas. And, and while it's not a technical thing, but if you have a really good idea and you can't get it to the market or to your company, then who cares? It doesn't matter. And, and we're going to talk about experience from the real world. So we, um, uh, we've been doing software now since uh, 1999. And uh, you know, we, we learned a lot of things, for sure, doing it. And, the good part about our company is, because I'm the president and we own the company, is if I think it's a good idea, we can do it. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Uh, but also, if other people have good ideas, uh, and I will tell you that the software group, and, and Dean knows because he works with them uh, closely also, they come up with ideas that we don't even ask them to do anymore. We just have to control them. Right, Dean? You have to control them because sometimes we were, we were having a discussion one day, and the head, the head of programming starts talking, and I said, well, show me. And then he starts, oh, well, no, wait, wait, let's do, let's, but it's really a great system. I said, but I don't know what you're talking about. You know, let's design the thing. And then once we designed it, and then by the next day, it, it was actually working. So, uh, and this is all, this is not theoretical. I also recommend uh, anybody to read Clayton Christensen's books on disruptive innovation. Uh, Briggs Morrison from AstraZeneca told me to read it. So he's a good supporter of ours. Doesn't give us business, but good supporter. And, <laughs> and, uh, and a good friend. But he, uh, he said read it because you'll really understand the challenges. And, and, uh, and, and it, the book really speaks. And he has three or four books. So uh, this I, I grabbed from one of, one of somebody who's now actually a data manager at Target Health. And, and it says every truth passes through three stages before it's recognized. And, and at first it's ridiculed, at second it's opposed, then it becomes self-evident. And what's interesting is that I always say that the person who ridiculed it always takes credit at the end that's their idea. So if you don't care who gets the idea, uh, but it's going to happen. So, so you have to have a tough skin and, and let, it, let it go alone. The other is, uh, which is really good, this is uh, Seaman Knapp, he, he was an agriculturalist in the early 1900s, and, and like the Affordable Care Act, whether you like it or not, in uh, you know, politics, there are a lot of experiments to be done in the Affordable Care Act. So what he did is, 
is he went down to his town in Georgia and they tried to do innovation. And, and what happened is uh, he said, you got to do this, you got to do that. There was a lot of resistance. Finally, he got someone to actually do it. And they saw that they grew 10 times as many years of corn as the neighbor. And all of a sudden, once they actually did it, everybody then adapted. So if, if you don't do it, it's just theoretical. Okay, the other is we, we had this discussion earlier about paper. Okay, so this is the problem, in, and we're at the clinical forum here. It is. This is the same site, same sponsor, REDC system. One, one study we monitored, the other one other people monitored. And it's just an example. Uh, we don't need the paper on the left. Even for informed consents, we don't need it anymore. Uh, we can sign that electronically, and we don't even need binders at the sites. They may have their own binders because they want to do things the way they do it, but we don't have to ask them to do that anymore. And uh, the question is, how do you get this to happen? And who's your customer? And the bottom line is, it's not the clinical sites. That's not the problem. Okay. The problem is the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. So what is it all about? How do you how do you get something to happen? So I, I, I tell people there are three things that are really difficult in life. And, uh, and then I translate this to something more formal. One, one is to have, to have good relationships with people. Uh, and that's the hard thing to do. Uh, people, the other is to have uh, good ideas. And the third is to get someone to part with their money for your ideas. And then someone told me the other day, the fourth is to get it, to execute the idea. So you get the money, but now you got to actually do it. So, but that relationship and trust is, and I, I saw the relationship and someone else put in the word trust. And, I, and you can put trust with a little T, and it doesn't have to be a big T. Uh, but it's really, but, and this is what, it, and, and we all have this, but we all get, it's like children have great ideas, they're very, and by the time they get to a certain age, you know, they don't want to innovate anymore. They say to be not too much. So, uh, uh, we, we, we just, once you understand this, then it's not so much difficult to do. Okay, so, uh, I was, we're doing some renovation in our apartment in New York City, so I found the box somewhere, and, and I found a document I wrote a bunch of years ago to try to convince Airs Labs, which became Wyeth, which became Pfizer, to do remote data capture. At the time, it was a, a couple of years ago. <laughs> and there was a, a computer a little fatter than that, but you know, it was a laptop. <coughs> and we had these floppy drives and all that stuff. And I said, and I came out of research, so I didn't know anything. I just you know, had ideas. And I said, why don't we, somebody, somebody had it. I forget the guy's name, but I wrote down somewhere. And he was too small, so I didn't want to use it. So, but here's what I wrote. I wrote, to decrease the time it takes, why, why should you do remote data entry? Uh, to decrease the time it takes to have accurate field data for analysis. And I had just joined the industry, and I couldn't believe I actually wrote this. And we actually visited a site in, um, in uh, uh, Kansas. Okay where someone was actually doing this. He had, uh, Fred Wolf, he's a rheumatologist, because I was working in rheumatology. He had a computer, and you could click on a patient's number and see all their lab tests for the whole time. He had this, long time ago. So it wasn't anything that wasn't there already 20 years ago or more. And then I said, well, an alternative is do remote. So here was the concept. So when you do software development, you have a concept. And I said, how do you achieve it? Well, the use of our, our remote data entry is to be effective tool. I won't be at all in clinical research. Must be approached in a stepwise manner. Take little baby steps. When you ever want to release software, always do baby steps, or else you have what happens to e-clinical perform things fresh. Uh, and since quality is really important, et cetera, and it, it's necessary to have a simplified data entry system. So here's a concept. You know? And then uh, how, do you, how do you achieve it? So you say, here's a concept. What is it? How do I do it? You know? and, and here's the initial test. Airs personnel, could, we could have even enter the data in the field. This was a paper. We were doing it anyway in the office. This was all paper case report forms. So I said, we can actually go to Kansas and enter the data. You know? In this matter, we can test it without bothering the investigator. And I, I was actually impressed. Like, I don't remember ever writing this. Okay. And then it may require some more people, all of this. If the investigator already has an existing data entry system, his performance can be compared with what we do. Okay. CRS could also be sent to New York according to existing procedures, et cetera. 
error rates, time to enter, corrections, general quality, time to data entry can be assessed without affecting study performance. So I think anybody who could write these things now about various systems. But then what happened, they told me to shut up. <laughs> Wasn't the first time or the last time someone told me to shut up. They said, since the software is not coming from IBM, go away. This will never, and someone, now that IBM's having a little trouble, I heard on Bloomberg uh, radio the other morning, and said, companies now are no longer saying that it has to be IBM, now that IBM is, only has 5% of their business in the cloud or something. So uh, that's also changing. So this was the challenge. It wasn't from a big company. Nobody was willing to take the risk. And they basically said, shut up. I also wanted to save heirs about 2 million sheets of paper because they asked, they asked adverse events in triplicate paper. But every visit had, was there an adverse event instead of having at the end adverse events were there any. And they just writing them in. And they threatened to fire them. Okay, so what's the problem if it ain't broke, uh, why fix it? And right now it is broken. Uh, we know that some companies aren't here because they have travel bans, right? Some companies didn't show up. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is in a bit of a stress, and, and we've been told by several very senior people in the industry that the current way we do clinical trials is unsustainable. Pfizer spent, I heard, you know, $800 million to find out that torcetropid did not work. That, that's not the phony billion dollars it cost to develop one drug, you know, but it, that was real money, you know. Most drugs don't cost a billion dollars to develop, but, you know, it's unsustainable uh, with John Orloff, who used to be at Novartis, now he's at Baxter. He said uh, three, four years ago, 95% of all drugs within five years will be generic. So we have to be very creative now and do it differently. So what it's all about, it's all about vision, leadership, and risk taking. <coughs> And here we don't have um, vice presidents usually from companies. And one of the things is that, and I'm going to recommend is you know, we can try to figure out how to get a vice president or two from one of these companies to, to come join us, especially if it's local. You know, maybe they'll come and they'll see how important uh, it is to get feedback from middlemen. So where, where do good ideas where do they actually come from? So some people think you hire Accenture and they'll tell you what to do. Pfizer, we heard this was a public lecture that they, they said they set up their risk-based monitoring paradigm. Um, I think I heard it correctly, but they said 3,500 hours, 100, to set up for the company without a particular study, just to go through the whole thing. And they probably, I guess, if they were in Accenture or something like that. Does, it, does your ideas come from the boss, consultants, employees, other sources? And I think most good ideas come from employees, as we heard from. Um, from Hank uh, earlier uh, on Monday. And, and the issue is how do you get this whole thing to happen? And I don't know the answer exactly, you know, because it has to do with the culture of the company, et cetera. And it has nothing to do with the size of the company. It has to do with the culture of the company. And the issue is how can we, as a group, encourage our companies uh, to take a small part of what we do take it out of P&L and get the innovation. It may take 10 years, but if, if you plan to be around for 10 years, uh, it's actually worth it. So uh, I, I just the example of the Post-it post story, most people know it, but I just I pulled it out of I think Wikipedia or something. So these were two accidents that led to the invention of the Post-it. Post okay, the Vice President back in 1968 uh, was working at 3M to try to create a better glue. They found this glue that wasn't too good Okay, it was, but you could peel it off and, and it would work. So uh, the adhesive wasn't interesting to the 3M management, it was, it was too weak, but it, it could stick to a surface and when you peeled it off, it didn't make a mess, like those tags that sometimes we have to wear. Okay, and you could actually hang them straight down, etc. So the second big feature was that it was reusable, it had a lot of nice features. Okay, despite these two wonderful features, uh, no one could come up with a good marketing use for it. Okay. Thus, it sat for years at 3M, nothing happened. Except, I, I hear when you went to 3M, they were all over the place on people's desks. Um, and by the way, the, the, your employees could give you some really great ideas because they're actually the ones actually using these things. So, 
Then someone uh, with Bay Products Laboratory Manager, he approached him again with the concept. He suggested what he saw was a good idea, okay, for bulletin boards, but they didn't think it was profitable, so they, they shelved it again. So we, I think we started back in 16, okay. Interesting, they still didn't think it was a good idea. Finally in 77, 3M began running some test sales. So that's my head okay. They called it Press and Peel. Turned out not much interest, which confirmed the minds of the executives that it was not a good idea. And I'll tell you something about preconceived notions. I worked with a guy from Israeli intelligence once a while back, just he was a friend of mine, I was helping him with some stuff. And they wanted to understand why they almost got destroyed in the Yom Kippur War. And the reason was there was a preconceived notion by the generals that the Egyptians would never attack. It was just their preconceived notion. But when they, after, after the attack happened and they did surveys and they did you know, lessons learned, they actually found out that the people in the street knew and the people in the press knew. It's just that the people in charge had a preconceived notion. So they only gathered that data to support their point of view. So uh, that, that's not also uncommon. So, so if you can avoid preconceived notions, it's a really good idea. That's why hackathons are nice. Yeah, because they hadn't really opened up. But somehow, five years after the constant rejection, it became one of the five top selling, selling uh, office supply products in the world and, and probably still use it. Maybe not as much, but Okay, so what's the problem? Okay, why, why is, and this is really important, why, why don't we see change the way we should? Okay. Uh, one is, uh, you know, people don't like change. Okay, if I told you uh, every week I'm gonna, you're going to move to a new house or a new apartment, you probably won't like it. Or every week you know, you're going to have to move to another city, you probably won't like it. Yeah. But we're not talking about that kind of change. So, so uh, and, and I'll tell you, our, our chief medical officer, I used to work for him at Pfizer, and now he's working with us. And he was told me he was at a meeting once, and I'm not picking on, on Pfizer, because I, I used to work there, it's a great company. But he said they were at a meeting, and, and they were talking about future plans, and someone said, uh, I have a five-year plan. And the vice president, he said, told them to be quiet. He says, I'm leaving in two years. What's the two-year plan? How can I make them happy for two years? Okay. Uh, I think that's not uncommon. Okay. So number one, there's no incentive for risk taking. Now, if your company had an incentive, I heard like Biogen, IDEC, failure, you can actually get points for failing. And I don't like failing, I'd say for things not working. So you shouldn't really, failure is a, is a bad word. Okay? And then if an engine fails and people die in a plane crash, that's a failure, okay? If you have a good idea and it didn't work, it's not a failure, okay? If you, if you were silly the way you executed it and you should have known better, and you should have known better but you were lazy or you were drunk or something like that, then it's a failure. But uh, I don't like the word failure. So there's no incentive, you gotta give an incentive for people to risk take, take risks, okay? Uh, people say, what's in it for me? Okay. Uh, these, these are the decision makers. I don't know about decision. Uh, FDA will beat us up. This is, we hear all the time, and I'm on the executive committee of the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, which is a Duke University, uh, FDA, uh, public-private partnership, and, and there were some discussions about serious adver adverse event reporting, and FDA was complaining, we only need 5% of these documents you send us all the time, and uh, he's sending us too many documents. We're actually bringing companies in and telling them to stop sending these SAE forms to us. We all really only need serious, unexpected, and related. Okay? Uh, so we actually get involved in that part of the business. And, and someone from a very big company said, well, we're worried about getting a 483. And I said to them, and I was on the phone, so I didn't know who I was talking to. I said, why are you worried about a 483? You're supposed to get a 483. Half the people, FDA says half, and we know the inspectors at FDA, we always give 483s. About 50% of all inspections give 483s. It's an audit finding, right, Tom? Audit finding. It's supposed to have an audit finding. But the audit finding shouldn't be that I falsified data. Okay, that shouldn't be the audit finding. So I wrote a paper, it's, it's on our website, and, and are we publishing now with Society of Clinical Research Sites in their journal because the reason I'm pushing sites is they are our customer. And I wrote a little limerick. And I won't say, but there were some regulators who reviewed this manuscript before to make sure it was correct. It's form FDA 483, not FDA form 83, so things like that. 
clear out a limer and says, when FDA issues a 483, the hammer comes down, that's the end of me. We're out of business, I lose my job, get me out of this mess, I pray to God. And it was sort of fun to write it, and I was a little nervous writing it, but FDA said it was okay. Uh, because <laughs> they, they don't understand why everybody's so terrified. And if you, we have, there's a paper that I'll send to anybody that FDA wrote, they don't turn you down for any of the things that we're worried about. So the risk taking that we want to take won't make your drug not get approved the way you're doing this, okay? And the other is risk avoidance, and the other is what if I lose my job if, if I fail, and I'm retiring soon. Uh, and and I, I think these are all very real. So you have to, when you're dealing with change in your company, when you're dealing with people who do this, you got to, who are in charge, you got to find out whether you even have a chance. Okay. And again, and again, at Biogenetic, you know, apparently, I, I don't know the whole story, but I'd love to hear it. It's coming from the CEO. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And he got a budget. I mean, what more could you want? You know. And what, uh, we won't. I won't mention company names here, but even though it's, it's somewhat public, but um, this this company was told by very senior management, you know, do something. Do something meaningful, not just something creative, but something meaningful, because we can't sustain the way we're doing this. So how do we implement change? We have to support a culture that supports risk taking in organizations. And again, um, you have to get senior management. If you don't have a senior management to commit to this, it's not going to happen. And that's what leadership is about. And, and Unfortunately, you know, CEOs who leave companies that aren't doing well and walk away with $120 million for failing. That's a true failure, okay? Um, and I, I think, you know, there's no way to take do risk taking in places like that, you know? If your CEO is gonna get rewarded by how well the stock price is five years from now, then you probably got a good CEO, okay, and a good board. But if you, get, you got someone who's gonna get rewarded the next quarterly report, you're going to fail. That, and I call that failure. You shouldn't go there. So you, you have to identify needs. What are the barriers to entry? Okay? You have to convince um, management to experiment and not be afraid to fail. And I think also to use examples of success. And, and somehow they have to understand, and that's why the, the Clayton Christensen books are really good, because they talk about you're doing well. You're making a living. The company's stock price is going up. Why change it? Why take you know ten million dollars, even though I'm, I'm making you know two hundred two billion or whatever I'm making? Why take a hundred million dollars and put it into real innovation? And the answer is that over time, if you don't grow through innovation, you will go backwards. And that Latin phrase, as I took Latin in high school, uh, not to go forwards is to go backwards. And you, you have you have to innovate all the time. But you can't innovate to the point where it puts you out of business because you've got to pay the rent, you know, and you've got to make your shareholders happy, your customers happy, et cetera, but uh, it's going to happen, you know. So leadership comes from the top, but I think ideas all come from the bottom and the middle. I think when I first joined the industry, I read uh, In Search of Excellence, which I, I'm going to reread. Someone said they were reading books from early ago, and I want to reread it because they talked about management by walking around. One of the problems of everybody working at home now is you can't manage by walking around. Okay? You can't do, you can't do a sniff test and say, you know, how, people, why are they in their office? Are they sitting at the coffee machine complaining? You, know, you don't know. If they're on the phone talking to people complaining, you don't know about it. So, uh, and, and that's one of the problems. When, uh, I think with remote working, one of the big problems is nobody really talks to each other. They really sort of do their job. And, and they're not, it's really not an environment. Okay? Do exploratory work. You may have to do it on your own time. Get a bunch of people that maybe some friends are willing to do it, and show somebody, show the ideas to somebody, you know. And then, of course, if they're not listening, you got to decide if I just stay at my job or go somewhere else. So, so I came up with this concept of uh, for discussion about uh, four types of innovation. Actually, my, my wife gave this to me. She said we have to have something we can copyright or something. Uh, so uh, we tried some other phrases, but this one, there was nothing on the internet like this, so we figured it's, it's unique. It's only reason I wrote copyright on the bottom, okay? Do I, am I allowed to do that on these slides? Okay. 
I, I normally don't do copyrights, but this one I just, just somebody just steals the idea. So, so uh, put all that aside. So I have a, a there's an innovation for A, for B, and for C on, on different levels. So for A is what, and I didn't know how to do the A, so we had to call it, we wanted for individuals, so we had to write all individuals. You know? So we had an A. Uh, B is for businesses, and B is even for, country, even for countries. So we're going to focus now on, on the middle one. And I thought we would do maybe uh, the last part of this is just uh, talk about what you have uh, in terms of, of companies. And what I'll do is I'll do the two slides, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, if you want, you can have some discussion. So is there a culture, and I'm going to ask this question when I finish, is there a culture in my organization that supports innovation? So we know at least one of them here is. I know Pfizer has innovation group. Craig Lipson is very active in innovation. And, and uh, Lily has an innovation group. And uh, EMD Serono, we used to call it Merck Serono, but they call it so. EMD Serono. And others may have innovation groups. Uh, AstraZeneca has an innovation group. Uh, Amgen has an innovation group. Uh, but we have some sponsors here, so I'd like to hear from them. I, if yes, how did it happen? Is it, how do they do it? Is it separate from current operations? The big thing is, can it run a project? Is there a budget? One of the things we learned with some of the innovation groups is that once they have an idea, they got to go around and find a business unit that will execute the idea. And that's not always so easy, because if you're in a business unit and you're trying to get a drug approved, the last thing you want to do is an experiment, because some guy from some other floor in the building or some other country or whatever it is. So, uh, so you, you have to have a budget. and. Even if it's a small budget, and we tell people, take a project that nobody, that they like to do, but it's not going to get done unless someone really wants to do it. And Zen Georgi, a Nobel Prize winner many years ago, said, if you actually want to get something done, hire somebody who wants to do it. Okay. So uh, we did one one project with one one of our clients that we worked with for many years. They wanted to wanted us to help them develop a drug with some kind of success. And I said, that's okay, we'll do it. I don't really want to do it. But we'll do it, but you have to use all of our paperless systems. And the guy's French guy, but I, he's a French person here, so I won't put on my French accent. You know, so. But it's says Jules. It says so Jules. <laughs> Jules, but you screw me. <laughs> but, you know, well, I, well, this will this be terrible? And, and I, it says, am I going to get screwed? And I said, no. He says, okay. Then let's go do it. Uh, so we want to know. Uh, can you give an example? Uh, was it successful? If yes, why no? And then if no. Is there a culture and organization that supports innovation? The answer is no. So the question is, have you tried it? If yes, what happened? Why the fear? And what would be needed to support innovation? So that's it. So what I'd like to do now is just open it up, and maybe we can start with the yeses, because that, that, that's the more positive, and then, and then see if you, if you want to share any experiences. And clearly, we, we don't have to talk about individuals. You know? And see see how it worked because for me it's been a very frustrating thing. But every once in a while, and it may take ten years, twenty years to get something done. So I come out of basic research, so I used to do three-year experiments with rats. So I'm used to that stuff. Not everybody is, you know. Wall Street not interested in long-term. So so except if anybody, or even if Biogen folks want to share a little more based on this presentation, but Merck, anything cooking? No innovation group in Merck? No. Okay. okay. And, and you know, when I was at Pfizer, Merck was the place. Yeah. Remember those days? Yeah. Okay. Well, we, got, we, uh, we got rid of all of our internal folks that do that work now, so we have to rely on business people coming up with lots of So everything is outsourced, then? Just about. Yeah. Everything, everything's outsourced. Huh? So,